While the last remaining people are being cleared to come in, let me first of all welcome you to this um, panel discussion. And of course, you know the subject of the discussion is on the Bell and Road Initiative, bringing the East and the West together, question mark. Um, but the question mark is left there so that we can actually have a open discussion as to whether the BLI actually brings the East and the West together, and if it does so, how it does so. I think it's always good to keep an open mind on it. The Bell and Road Initiative is clearly a very important issue for China and arguably for the rest of the world because it is something that affects most of the countries that are being studied at SOAS, which is why we are doing this uh, panel discussion here. And before I introduce the speakers and other, for those arriving, please do just come in and then there are spaces for you. Um, let me first of all be clear that this event will be captured by video so that you know it will be filmed and if you have a problem with the filming, now is the time to make sure that uh, you make that view known. The panel discussions will be uh, conducted in a way to encourage the panelists to discuss and potentially debate among themselves and also with you. And I will try to guide that process. And for the panelists, I'm delighted that we have here uh, two very distinguished guests from Hong Kong, from our partner organization in hosting these events, the Silk Road Economic Development Research Center in Hong Kong. The first one of them is Mr. Joseph Chen, who is the chairman of the uh, research center in Hong Kong. He's had a career as an investment banker, and he's also an executive director of the Kaizen Holdings Limited in Hong Kong. The other Hong Kong panelist is Professor Thomas Chen. He is the director of the One Bell, One Road Institute at the Zhu High College of Further Education in Hong Kong. And he has a long academic career where he had taught at different institutions, including the University of Hong Kong, and he also served as head of the China Business Center at the Hong Kong Polytechnic University. And the other panelist is our own Charles Parton. Uh, Charlie is with, with us here, and he's also with the China Dialogue with Rusi, and he's also at the moment serving as a specialist advisor on China to the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee. Charlie has, is a career diplomat with long service in China, including observing and reporting on the 19th Party Congress last October. Now, what I would suggest we do is that I will ask our panelists a few questions and they will respond. And if any of the other panelists would like to chime in at any one point, they're welcome to catch my eyes. And after a round of discussion here, then I'll open this to the floor. And if you could uh, say who you are uh, before you raise your questions or make your comment, that would be fantastic. Please try to keep it as succinct as possible. Then we can squeeze in more of your uh, interventions. So let me start. Let me start by asking Thomas, um, what does the Chinese government want to achieve with the Bell and Road Initiative? Is there a master plan? Or if, there's, if there is a master plan, what does it look like? If there's no master plan, what drives the Chinese government? What guides the Chinese government in terms of the Bell and Road Initiative? I think there's originally, there's no master plan. And the Chinese government are not sure what to do. Even up to now, uh, we haven't seen any uh, coordination uh, very conscious by the Chinese government. 
in except uh, in Pakistan, the China Pakistan economic corridor, there's a national program, but still it's not very coordinated. I think the whole thing comes uh, quite natural. Uh, since the 1990s, I mean, uh, in the past uh, there was always civil war, and civil war was blocked by the great power uh, game between uh, uh, Russia and uh, and uh, England. And after the the Cold War, I think there's a possibility of uh, collecting the civil war again. And so you can see that there are many organizations, including uh, Asian Development Bank, uh, uh, UNESCO, uh, even uh, the UN's uh, Economic Commission of uh, uh, Europe, they start to uh, build up the link again uh, between China and Europe. So uh, China come at a time when uh, all these kind of uh, uh, programs have been set up, uh, feasibility studies have been done, but uh, there's not much money to uh, uh, implement them. So China come to pay for the uh, expenses. Uh, uh, there's also there's a, a, a factor it's because uh, China has changed, uh, transformed itself from an importing uh, capital country into a, a, a capital exporting country. So you had to think about what to do with uh, the way they export capital. So the the Silk Road, the, all these kind of plans by other organizations come quite handy for China to use uh, them as the basis for its uh, reorganization of its export, uh, uh, outward uh, uh, economic uh, 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 activities. So uh, this is a very natural outcome, not because of China, but because China, uh, uh, that uh, it will become a more a kind of a, a bell and road initiative. But up till now, I'm not sure whether China is at a, a very a conscious uh, kind of a master plan. China is learning about it, trying to uh, uh, change itself again in the process. It's great that you say that China doesn't have a master plan. And I think you're absolutely right there that China doesn't have a master plan. But then the spread of the Belt and Road does raise questions. You talk about the Silk Road, which was the original um, Silk Road Economic Bell. There's also the parallel Burintown Silk Road that went through Southeast Asia into the Indian Ocean and further west. Those are easy. That makes sense. How does New Zealand get into the Bell and Road? How, 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 how do you have countries that really are geographically so far from either the land route or the Burintown route fit into Bell and Road? Uh, I think in the Ming and Qing dynasty, uh, the Silk Roads covered the whole world, not just uh, Europe and China. So you can see, see the export silver in exchange for silver uh, products from China extended to Americas, to Africa, uh, everywhere. So there's uh, actually uh, not much land has been ignored by the Silk Road. It's not because of China. The more because uh, the merchants are trying to carry out a uh, trade with all countries that, that all locations that's uh, possible. It's, it's, it's one one great thing to say that China trades with the rest of the world, and China does. China is one of the leading trading powers in the world. It's also one thing to say that in the past, Imperial China had also trade with different parts of the world, but, but just... those were not the Silk Road. When they talk about the Silk Road in the imperial past, they were talking about what essentially to, in today's language is the Silk Road economic bell. It didn't include the others. They were other parts of trade. But so, you look at the trade uh, in, the, in the last past centuries, it's not just trade by the, the imperial government of China. It's in fact, the Chinese government tried to forbid uh, trade. I think uh, you can see that uh, uh, the European coming uh, to force open China's door for trade. And even before that, uh, China had, the merchants from China had trade all, all everywhere, even against the, the orders of the central government. So it's not so much uh, an act of imperial government, but it's an act of uh, many agencies, many countries, many uh, uh, individual uh, merchants involved. So it's uh, a market force. The force is that uh, the, there's available of uh, uh, silver in the world from uh, Japan, from uh, America, and with the silver, they can trade goods from China. And, and because of the silver influx, China had to produce more for overseas market. And whether you will go to Europe or whether you go to other countries depends not so much by China's imperial order, but rather by the merchants. 
Okay. The... I'll move on. Joseph, how is BLI financed? And what investment opportunities are there for other people, particularly people in the recipient countries of the Barren Road uh, projects? Well, well, and some of the <coughs> Chinese uh, colleagues have compared the Barren Road with the Marshall Plan. Can it really be comparable? So three questions there. Okay. Well, obviously, uh, you know, China put this, you know, Barren Road initiative up and uh, Initially, China is funding almost everything. I wouldn't say, you know, 100% because China don't have that money. But uh, at the beginning, you know, it's basically um, through policy banks, uh, you know, uh, state-owned enterprises going, you know, outside of China to, uh, to finance it. And um, at this current moment, you know, um, China is implementing, you know, the um, Asia infrastructure investment bank to help okay because you know uh, obviously china cannot afford to put up 100 percent of everything you know in the initiative and uh to be honest it's no longer an initiative you know it's been on for five years it's a development already and uh, china has attracted participants from um, the like of uh, temasek of singapore um, and other sovereign funds to come in and, and help so uh, funding is beginning to uh, get into commercial entities rather than um, just, you know, Chinese government. And, uh, you know, uh, even in London, there are investment managers, you know, putting up cash or raising cash and put it into, uh, you know, the Belt and Road countries. Um, and um, in, in terms of... Um, Opportunities, you know, uh, in the Belt and Road countries, obviously, you know, uh, huge, because you know, uh, uh, as you raised, you know, uh, the question that why New Zealand, New Zealand is involved. New Zealand needs money also, so there is opportunity investing into New Zealand also, uh, other than the typical um, emerging markets like Africa or uh, the ASEAN countries, or, and uh, as well as you know Central Asia. So plenty of uh, opportunities for not just, you know, government organizations, but business entities, you know, to put in, you know, money in, and invest. What about the people in the recipient countries? How are they benefiting from it? And what are the opportunities for them to invest and benefit from the whole thing? In, uh, in contrast to the governments involved in those countries? Apart from, you know, uh, some, you know, developing countries, you know, emerging markets, <laughs> People would benefit, in my uh, my uh, you know uh, point of view, uh, they have a better living to begin with, you know, with the Chinese money, okay. And uh, for example, you know, they have better roads, they have um, a train to ride instead of you know walking, and uh, uh, what in some of the what do it do to the really poor people who can't afford the train fare and they don't drive? They can't use the road. They well, at least the they can walk, they you know, in the road. Uh, I give you an example of my own. You know, uh, we invest into a country called Tajikistan. It's a landlocked country, high altitude. We built a road there, and uh, yeah, they don't, they can't afford uh, to ride a car, but they can walk in a better condition. Okay, okay they benefit, you know, certainly from that, and. Uh, as you know, for those you know uh, developing countries, you know where people are a little you know richer than the emerging markets, we have co-investors. You know, we, the, China needs partners locally, and uh, you know, through joint ventures, you know, through cooperative joint ventures, equity joint ventures, they can make money as well. So there is opportunity, definitely. And how is it compared to the Marshall Plan? The Marshall Plan was mostly. Grants in aid, Bell and Road are mostly loans. I, I wouldn't say. Mean, I wouldn't say. I. I. I would say. You know, uh, initial stage. You know, is grant financial aid, and uh, China do not expect to get them back. To be honest, all right. But uh, you know, going down the road, uh, you know, loans. It depends on you know uh, whether the country can afford to raise the loan. Okay, well, a lot of criticisms on, you know, China uh, putting in, you know, very uh, stringent uh, conditions. And at the end of the day, if the recipient country cannot pay back, China will take over. Um, 
I think um, it depends on how you look at it, right? If you borrow, okay, and if you cannot meet the, the requirements, what is the problem? What is the problem of having, you know, you know uh, your asset, you know, foreclosed by the lender? That's a fair, fair deal, right? You know, I, I would say, you know, um, a lot of the uh, misconceptions, you know, from, you know, the West, if you look at it from the West, yeah, well, you know, we don't have the money now. So we, we you know, it's sour grapes, you know, well, you know, you know. Well, does that make it into an argument that fits in with some people uh, who says that the Bell and Road therefore creates debt traps for countries which cannot afford those wonderful modern infrastructure and in the end they have to pay with their shirts well they can always turn to uh, the west for help <laughs> well okay I'll, I'll i'll leave it there there on that particular one <clears throat> for the moment and turn to charlie <clears throat> well first of all the question is i want you to take a completely different perspective and ask you what you think about the arguments you have heard so far whether it is about the uh, master plan or whether it is about the it is fair that if you can't pay your debt you may pay with your assets argument and also i want you to um share with us whether whether what we have heard so far of chinese government policy and how chinese government proposed to deal with uh, the financing of bell and row Times if your understanding of what it is meant to do, and what you think, and, and what you think the um, British and European governments look how they look at the Baron Row Initiative. Do we understand it correctly? Do we understand it in a way that are being presented, or are we looking at it in the wrong way? So, Steve, I, you've given me an hour, have you, to answer all that? Uh, no, five minutes, Max, sir. <laughs> um, yes, there are lots of very interesting points there, and, and I hesitate to, to talk with people who come from Belt and Road Institutes because they do this professionally all day. Um, and, and, and controversially, the first thing I would say is, is that Belt and Road doesn't, it doesn't exist. The BRI, we shouldn't, it's a slogan, it's meaningless, and, and really we shouldn't use it because it, it, it's everything. Uh, it's things, projects that are passed, that happened before Belt and Road started. It's pro projects all over the world. Okay, so it's a slogan and it's a propaganda tool and it's very successful. Great, well, that's very well done. But what is serious and what is really important is what it really represents, which is Chinese globalization. And that's been going on since, since uh, Jiang Zemin in 1999 with his Zhou Chu policy of going out. Uh, and that's extremely important. So it's, in that sense, not at all meaningless. And, and that's what we in the West have to react to. It's, it's reacting to China's globalization, um, both its, its, its beneficial and, and its competitive parts. Uh, I agree with both speakers that um, um, you, Steve, when you say there's, there's no master plan uh, in one sense. There is, however, a very coherent set of aspirations, and that's in the March 2015 plan. Uh, Belt and Road Plan um, put out by the NDRC. Uh, so I, I think that's really very important that people look at that and see the five areas where Belt and Road is, is, is and I, you have to use the phrase of how much you should want to say Chinese globalization, um, where, 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 where it is, is, is very relevant. And there is a tendency, and I, and I think we've started it already, to concentrate on projects and investments and trains and roads, etc., and actually not look at the other four aspects of that plan, which are really, really important. So the first one is, is basically China, global governance. Uh, then you have facilities connectivity, which does mean infrastructure projects, etc. But it also means things like internet connectivity. Uh, you've got financial stuff, very, very important, and I'm sure you can c c comment on that. Unimpeded trade extremely important i mean both in terms of customs making things much flow much more uh, fast but also a very competitive uh, angle in terms of standards this is probably the most important part of of, of, of uh, chinese globalization who sets the standards for industry because on that is based as, as, as to who benefits in in trade and and markets most so you know people don't talk about that very much it's extremely important and that's an area where uh, uk and europe must 
engage with China, um, both cooperatively and, and, and probably um, competitively as well. And, and the fifth one is, is people to people, which can include um, just about everything. So I think it's really important to see that um, in, a, in, a, in a much wider um, context. I'm not sure that um, I, I necessarily go along with your, your view on financing that, well, if people get into debt, they just default and, 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 and who loses. Um, yes, uh, actually, of course, if, if uh, countries do default on their debts to China, uh, that is a problem for China. Uh, and, and, and China, I think, um, I'm sure is making great efforts to ensure that its, its um, loans are perhaps a little bit better structured than it, what they were in the past. This is serious money that, that, that could be at stake. Um, and China, we always talk about China's internal debt, but there are those that feel that China may have quite an external liability too. But for the countries that are receiving it, it doesn't really help because to the, in the process to getting towards that default, you go through an awful lot of pain uh, in, in terms of the way uh, you know, paying interest, trying to pay off the interest, even if eventually you decide you can't. And, and that money is going away from other development, developmental needs of the people. So I, I, I'm not sure that uh, it, it's an answer just to say, well, the West can step up. Uh, recently, America has announced a large amount of money, but it's, 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 not, it's not by no means um, uh, the answer. What's the UK government view? What's, what's, what's the European government's view? I think this is changing a little bit uh, from a rhetoric of uh, a golden era to a much more realistic uh, approach to this. And, and that's right. I mean, BRA is a slogan, but beneath it is, is Chinese globalization. And we should look at the projects. We should look at the governance issues or the standards issues, the concrete things, and, and work off those. Uh, and I think there's a much more realistic attitude being developed by, by Europe and the UK on, on, on where we can cooperate, work well together, where it adds up, and, and where, quite frankly, we have to agree that we're going to compete. That's, that's the way the world is, um, and in, in a number of ways, which we can go into detail, uh, if you wish, Steve. But um, sorry, I, that's short of my hour, but, but lo longer than your five minutes. Well, thank you. It's a short hour. I would like to give you a chance to respond. Are you comfortable with this characterization that BRI really is just slogan? It's, it means everything, therefore it means nothing. And what we really are looking at is China's globalization. That's not to diminish the importance of China. It's just a different way of looking at it. Yeah, there's two things. One is that uh, China trying to build a, a, a global uh, joint ventures with all the, all the countries involved. So China's emphasized very much uh, the spirit of uh, Silk Road. Silk Road is not so much uh, dominated by China. It's not like a Marshall Plan uh, to give out the loan so that you can conquer the market of Europe. China is just uh, providing uh, all these uh, investment uh, funds that may not turn out to be uh, beneficial to China, but at least uh, in the short term period. So China is trying to build up uh, something. So you can see that uh, uh, with this uh, China's initiative, with China's money pouring in, you can see the other countries involved. Those countries involved uh, along the Silk Road also put up their own money uh, so that uh, there will be more money used for infrastructure. And for example, even Japan, they're competing with China. So you can see that uh, in Myanmar, uh, Japan forfeit more funds, more loans than China. So uh, China uh, stirred up uh, uh, the whole thing so that uh, all the countries had to follow. Even America had to follow. Even Europe had to follow to invest in uh, Japan, Africa. So it's not so much a, a way that China creates a, a master plan to conquer the world to uh, implement uh, globalization of China. But we, in fact, in the process, because China cannot dominate, cannot control the whole things, it relies on all this kind of interactive uh, response from others. So they are building up a, a process for changing uh, the status quo in, in the world nowadays. And the status quo is that uh, many countries involved in the Belt and Road have been ignored by uh, the developing country, by international organization, and also by multinational corporation investment. So uh, you can say that China uh, investing there, they are not, uh, may not be uh, for commercial interest because they cannot uh, get back the loans. But without the Chinese money, nobody is investing. So this is a, 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 a way that China is uh, trying to uh, change it. The other thing is that China has something uh, uh, larger uh, in vision. Uh, 
uh, our presidents talk about uh, a community of a uh, common destiny, although uh, we are not sure how to achieve it. But China is trying to use the existing uh, multilateral cooperation, multilateral uh, agreement to build up something uh, that we share. And you can see the last year when we had the summit of uh, the Bay and Road uh, Initiative, it was a uh, part of the uh, UN series of uh, uh, alliance of uh, civilization. The focus is on alliance of civilization, not on clashes of civilization, or one civilization dominate the other. So this is a, a larger, uh, a more ambitious kind of uh, aim of the Chinese president. Uh, may not be shared by everybody in China, but at least uh, as a uh, very uh, responsible uh, political leader, it raises a certain kind of idea for not only for China, for the world to think about it. Okay. I'll come back to you, um, uh, uh, Joseph, and ask you the, the same question. But before that, I think Charlie wants to respond to what Thomas just said. Yes. Yeah. Um, let, let's not take away from what, what China has achieved and what China has given and is giving to the world. E excellent. And I have, I have no quarrel with that. And I particularly uh, have sympathy with the idea that China has basically stirred up uh, the financial pot. Good. And, and there are many other um, things that we should welcome in Chinese globalization. But um, Xi Jinping and others have said that Belt and Road Initiative is, is the main plank of their foreign policy. Countries' foreign policies <clears throat> are not altruistic. They simply aren't. I'm sorry, but they... And, and, and furthermore, if you actually look at the uh, genesis of the Belt and Road and what lies behind it, the important motivations are domestic, and I could go into that in, in, in great detail, but if one looks at Wang Jisoo's original paper, which I think was very much instrumental in the um, de devising of the whole strategy, and I do recommend people to read it, even though it includes the word geostrategy in the, in the title, the reasons that he's giving for why this strategy should be adopted are mainly domestic. So it's about markets, energy, it's, 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 it's about stabilizing Xinjiang and disparities. Uh, it's, it's about getting more technology for, for China, which is exactly what Xi Jinping, Wang Yi, uh, Yang Jiechi have said in their comments on, 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 on Belt and Road at various times. It is benefiting China. That's fine. That's, you know, everyone, the country's foreign policy is designed to benefit your country, and it's also based on domestic needs and, and uh, things. So I, I don't think we should um, sort of uh, go overboard on that this is about the, the, the uh, uh, a destiny of uh, common future for mankind, etc. That too is, 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 uh, is a phrase which um, may or may not have, have um, purchase in China, but it doesn't really cut it in, in, uh, in, in Europe. Yeah. <laughs> quick, so quick, sharp response, Bill. I'm not sure how we relate the domestic issues and the foreign policy of China. This is not a simple mechanical exercise. I worked in, on China for decades, and I worked with uh, some of the uh, top think tanks in China uh, uh, within a uh, confidential area. Uh, I, I don't see the, the kind of speculation that are really actually shaping the policy-making process in China. In fact, I do not think uh, outside world knows so much about the policy-making process in China. So try to figure out a big picture, good story. It's all right for, uh, for marketing purpose, but can we learn from the world by this kind of uh, f stories? Well, I, I, if I may just come back on that. I think that's a call, a call for transparency because we in the West are going to react to Chinese globalization one way or another. So whether we know how, how Chinese policy is made or not, whether we may make mistakes, our perceptions matter uh, because we will react to them. And so I would say maybe, maybe China's political system needs to be an awful lot more transparent so we don't make the mistakes that, that, that you think we're making. Okay. Let me go back to you, um, Joseph, to the question that... Uh, Charlie put on the table first. Is it a better way to look at China's going out policy in the prism of the BRI, or is it better to see it in terms of China's globalization? Well, I, I, I kind of, you know, agree with um, Charlie's saying, you know, um, this, you know, Belt and Road Initiative is very hollow. You know, it, it's a label. <laughs> Uh, China learned it from the West. We never had marketing. We are now having marketing, <laughs> right? We learned it from Harvard. 
you know, uh, you know, it's a good thing. In other words, we cannot draw attention to the world, what we are doing. It's like, you know, uh, Vice President Mike Pence said in the APEC meeting that, you know, China, you know America is putting up $1.4 trillion just to catch an attention, all right? So I, I, I don't dispute that. But this, you know, initiative is not something new. You know, it, it went back all the way to, uh, obviously, the ancient Silk Road. But uh, more recently, you know, last century, in the 50s, you know, the modern China, you know, helping Africa to build up our relationship so that we can get nominated back to the UN. We started this. And then in the 80s, you know, we put in a lot of efforts. At the time, China was still very poor. But we put in a lot of, you know, um, efforts to build infrastructure for the Middle East countries. And we got screwed. You know, we put in a lot of money, you know, never get back. We said nothing, right, because, well, we're Confucius, very confused. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this initiative, you know, is, is a complement of, you know, 1997, you know, uh, going out policy. We, we, we went out. At the time, we were a little bit better. Our foreign exchange reserve was climbing up. And then 2013, you know, it was more or less at the peak of our, you know, reserve. You know, we, we had about, what, f close to $4 trillion? you know, uh, dollars of reserve. So we need to spend it. And America wants us to spend it. So we spent it, you know, actually in 2008 when we helped, you know, the West, you know, during the global financial crisis. And probably our president, you know, thinks that, well, this is time to make a big thing out of it. You know, so, you know, the Bell and Road Initiative. I, I do not believe, you know, uh, this is something wrong because, you know, um, the West wanted to be number one, China, maybe. But, you know, uh, my, our, our Chinese characteristic is always, you know, let's be number two. Because being number one has a lot of, you know, weight to carry. When China was united historically, it never satisfied for being number two. Qing was number one. Tang was number one. Ming was number one when the, when the Mongols were not beating them. And you can go all the way back to Han and to Tang. Probably, you know, they didn't, you know, choose to be number one. They were made number one at the time. <laughs> well, a very nice way to put it, that... I, I think it, one might uh, interpret the second centennial goal as a desire to be number one, but I'll be dead by 2049. No, I mean, it's like, you know, most of the Chinese believe, you know, uh, it's better to be probably number four, because number one can fall then number two has to take up the responsibility. So being number four, probably we are safer. <laughs> Who therefore would be number two and number three? <laughs> uh, well, you don't have to be told you're number one or number two or number three. It depends on how you flex your muscles. At this current moment, who's flexing more muscles? It's the number one. All right, we'll leave it, leave it there for the moment. <laughs> Just want us to um, stay there on one remark, which is that while the West, the West have popularized a lot of things, and a lot of them are very, very good, not every things that the West has popularized are great, one of which is hubris. That got us to the financial, global financial crisis. So that's one thing perhaps good for China not to learn from us in terms of the kind of hubris that uh, could put us in a very tight spot, and it could also potentially put China in a very tight spot. I want to move on to ask you, the panelists, how do you see BRI or China's globalization, whichever way you want to put it, changes the world? I mean, what do you see as the likely positive outcomes and what do you see as the likely negative ones? Uh, you know, uh, the... Uh, Joseph, if you could a bit further from the mic. Oh, all right, that, that would help. Uh, <laughs> It's, you know, this Belt and Road Initiative, you know, drew a lot of attention, you know, on China, which is a good thing because we were always, you know, uh, in the past lagging behind. Now we are, you know, on the uh, international arena. And um, honestly, you know, the, this initiative, let's, let's don't focus on, you know, the label. You know, China is like any other country, wants to do more business, you know, want to have more um, representation, you know, globally. So we do that. And, you know, the Chinese language is only recently picked up by the West. Otherwise, you know, um, everybody here speaks English. 
you read, you know, the English media. You know, uh, how many of you read the Chinese media? Not a lot. Well, you are one of them. Yeah, but apart from you, no. So when you look at the, when you read the Chinese media, is do they tell you different things? Pretty much what you're saying about the Yeah. Well, <laughs> so when you read the West, you know, it's all about, well, China is doing bad things. Is that right? So why? <laughs> I mean, why, do, why don't we all think from other you know, people's perspective? So I think we should talk a balance. You know, it's not always, you know, China is the villain. You know, we, we're not. <laughs> You know, how much... Well, the question was, what are the good things that China is going to bring about? No, I, I'm, coming, I'm, the, I'm, I'm coming to that. Things. I'm coming All to that. All government major policies will have good and, po and negative. It, it depends on how you look at it. From the government's point of view, it's always good. But, you know, uh, we criticize the government. I don't like, you know, our government putting up all the, all the loans, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, the recipient countries. Because at the end of the day, how many of them can repay? Not a lot. At the end of the day, what do China do? Forfeit them. Forget it. Have you ever read that? Take, for example, Central Asia that I, I, I just talked about. How much financial aid of, you know, loans turn into financial aid? Read the paper. Almost all. Okay. How many countries repay China? Not a lot. I, mean, I think we should look at it in a broad broader terms, you know, it brings good things. At the end of the day, you know, they can't repay. What can we do? All right, turn it into financial aid. Forget it. EDRB, you know, they work on it. They ask me, why is China not asking, you know, these countries to live up to their promises? Well, I mean, we, we, we do have a concrete case, which is very hot at the moment, and that's Pakistan. Yeah. Um, Pakistan is in a financial meltdown. It owns China a lot of money. Yeah. It can't pay China back. It's going to the IMF for money. The IMF is basically saying that, well, we're happy to lend, provided what we lend will not simply be used to repay China. We will only lend to improve the financial situation in Pakistan. Now, Pakistan is an extreme case at the moment. You potentially will have other countries in Central Asia that may get into a similar situation under, under BRI. What do you see the Chinese government going to do about it? Will the Chinese government write off the loans to Pakistan and enable Pakistan to get the IMF loans and rebalance its economy and get out of the financial hole? I, I think it's a very interesting question. Uh, on the one hand, Pakistan or the world claim that, you know, China puts Pakistan into this situation. But then, you know, um, Mr. Khan went to Beijing and Shanghai recently and asked for more money. All right, so why? Yeah, yeah. they do. <laughs> why? Because they don't have a choice, right? Let's be practical. You know, all these are nonsense. You know, they need the money. That's only China, you know, that could provide the money. So you go to China. All right, and if I were... Xi Jinping, I would turn the loan into investment, all right? But then again, you know, we'll create another issue, all right? Oh, China is taking over Pakistan. Come on, you know, we're different breed. <laughs> well, how are we going to take over Pakistan, all right? So, you know, I, I, I think, uh, again, it, it's, you know, a, a, it's a, a misconception that, you know, China is conquering the world. We, we, <laughs> we can't afford to conquer the world. I, I don't think we actually think <clears throat> we think that, and, and, and um, you know, the history of Pakistan is, <clears throat> um, in terms of Western involvement, has not been very happy, and, and, and it may end up that way for China. I don't know. But the question was, what what good is coming out of Chinese globalization? And I, and I, I just think it's to quote Premier John Lai a little earlier to say, um, we, we, I mean, there are many good things, or it, it just depends on the way that. Um, it goes down the line. It can go to good or, or ill. I mean, for instance, Chinese um, uh, greater involvement in the world. Uh, the most important issue in my mind is, is what happens to the environment. Is China's going out to globalization going to be a force for good, not just climate change, but localized in terms of, let's say, water problems or, or, or sustainability of, of agriculture and things like that? Um, 
that's that's a really important question and 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 china if it if it does it in the in the right way would be an amazing force for good if it does it in the wrong way it'll be very bad so and you can you can you know it's again when it comes to the question of finance if if china is financing projects that are sustainable and 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 help developments of countries it cannot be anything other than a force for good if it, if it's financing badly for, for whatever reason then the opposite apply uh, and there are other questions you know, to what degree will China, in terms of, if you look at the, the, the whole Belt and Road plan and the governance issue, to what degree will China play a, a positive role in, in UN and peace and stabilization? It's playing a much bigger role than, than it has done. Uh, and, and I think so far that's, that, that's, that's been good. Um, but, but there are, are other areas where um, people worry, South China Sea, as to, as, as to whether China's role is ultimately going to be peaceful. Um, and again, other things, will China itself open up and, and allow a level playing field? For all Xi Jinping's talk about um, uh, globalization, uh, the perception in Europe and, and, and in Australia and the West is generally, <coughs> is that China isn't providing a level playing field. And, and finally, one comes to a question of, of, of values in China's globalization. Will China and China's rise be good for the world in terms of its values. And these aren't Western values. These are values to which China itself has signed up under the various UN conventions and are in China's own constitution. So this isn't an East-West argument. It, it, it's a question of the degree to which China, through transparency, through uh, the internet governance, through various other things, in, including its, uh, its surveillance capabilities, uh, are these going to be a force for good or for, or, or, or for ill? And, and uh, I don't want to say either at the moment. I think it's too early to say. But these are the big questions. Uh, when you talk about uh, globalization of China, you have to uh, remember that first, there's, uh, in the last uh, few centuries, there's a globalization of Britain, and then it's a globalization of America. But the problems we face nowadays in the world is not just a, a result of the globalization of China, but more a result of the globalization of Britain and, uh, and America. So uh, uh, you, you see that uh, China is not uh, uh, trying to itself to be the savior of the world. That you should not expect China to be the savior. And in fact, uh, you can see that the world, uh, there's still a uh, very, very much a Western interest from the globalization of Britain, from the globalization of America, trying to, uh, to perpetuate the existing problems. So uh, well, I think uh, the better way is to see China's uh, globalization is a way that uh, the world together to help to solve the problems. So you should not just bring the, uh, uh, put the blame on China or to put the responsibility on China, but the whole world should uh, work, to, work together. And not only just uh, to turn the globalization into a good exercise, but we have to clear all this the problem created by the globalization of Britain, globalization of America. So this is, uh, when, we, when our president used the, the summit of the BRI uh, as a part of the alliance of uh, civilization of the UN program, this alliance of youth civilization, we work together. So uh, I, I think that we, we, it seems to be we are uh, uh, too much uh, standing uh, 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 from the certain position and to see China as the antithesis of the existing world and trying to help you uh, uh, force China to change in the way you think that would be good. Well, um, welcome to being number one, because whether you're Britain in the 19th century or America in the 20th century, as number one, you are unpopular. That's just a fact of politics, I'm afraid. Uh, and, and it's up to, uh, you just have to deal with it. And of course, as they say, they prefer China to be number four. <laughs> Now, we have passed the uh, halfway point of our time for this panel discussion. So I'm going to actually now open it um, to everyone. And we have four, keep your hands up, please. Um, we have four uh, student ambassadors with microphones. So I think you have your hands up first. I, that's the first one I saw. I'll try to get as many of you in as, as possible. And, in the front, in the middle, in the front, please.
And if you could be as uh, succinct as you can, we can try to squeeze in as many as possible. Of I course. won't necessarily get all of them. So if you have a particular person you want to direct this to, say so. Yes. Um, I just wanted to firstly say with regards to Western media kind of perceptions of China, it does normally tend to focus on the negative stories, as you say. And uh, but I think perhaps tonight we haven't addressed some of the more signs of kind of risks and examples of BRI failure, namely, you know, what happened in Sri Lanka, the Hambota port, um, you know, th that is a s significant risk for partnering nations to have a sovereign territory taken over on a 99 year lease. Um, it's an incredibly large risk and I think one which um, hasn't necessarily been factored in to uh, the decision making process behind funding funding. So one of the biggest risks I think for BRI at the moment is kind of partnering with nations that you know that the domestic politics can change. We've seen this in Myanmar, we've seen it in Malaysia and in Pakistan as well slightly but not to the same extent as in as in Sri Lanka and Malaysia. Um, you know politicians are elected they come in and say we we don't want this kind of funding it's it's releasing our sovereignty I mean we've probably had too much of this phrase in the UK but um, what I wanted to ask is because um, in the process of uh, funding these projects China specifically says we are not bringing political judgments we are not the Marshall Plan we are funding not on the basis of domestic politics are they um, will they have to start thinking more about domestic politics in order to secure the future of these projects? Okay, uh, um, I think that's uh, yeah, well, so, uh, Obviously, I'm not from the uh, CIFA service, you know, I, I cannot represent the country, but uh, the way I look at it, uh, at the time, Sri Lanka wanted the money. They wanted to, uh, you know, uh, build up a better economy, so they went to China. All right, and China, you know, you come to us, you know, we think about that, we give you the money. And uh, they, they don't think, you know, that thoroughly no, uh, at the beginning. Now, you know, after, you know, five years, they learned the lesson. They would, you know, obviously consider all political, you know, aspect of making a loan or a grant or an investment in a foreign country. And uh, it's not, probably it's too early to say, you know, it's a failure. You know, it's like, <laughs> China leads Hong Kong to, to Britain for 99 years. You know, Hong Kong did well, all right? And I, I suppose, you know, Britain did not expect that. But, uh, you know, Hong Kong people, you know, did their, their work and uh, at, the, at, at the end of the day, you know, Hong Kong prosperous. I suppose if, you know, if you look at, you know, a uh, longer term, Sri Lanka, they need to build up a better economy, you know, and to survive, you know, they have to uh, learn the lesson internally, you know, their politics, you know, they got to play a better, you know, politics, you know, look, feed the people before you talk about politics. That's, you know, what, how, the way I look at it. And also, you know, um, at the end of the day, you know, is China going to take over? Probably not, you know, <laughs> the world is watching China. How can China, you know, just take over the port? I, I, I you know, it's a question, you know, it's a big question. I cannot answer, but I'm sure, you know, um, the world is watching. If China do move and, and you know, take over, everybody will go against it. Yeah. I, I would like to give an uh, example. In Myanmar, Japan's investment has a five-year plan. Even the South Korea and Finland has a five-year plan of the doing in Myanmar, but China has no plan. So what, what do you expect China? Uh, for example, when uh, in Thailand, well, when with a, a, a Japanese uh, uh, loan, there was an official of Japan sitting in the government office of the Thai, Thai government. Should China do that same? Okay, I think if it's basically on the same line, we probably uh, try okay. not to, so that we get more questions from the uh, from the floor. Charlie, you wanted to provide a Wait, but, contrary view. Just, just very briefly, when I before I came here, I made a, a, a list of risks. Just and there were eleven from Chinese thinkers that I put down on, on the risks for China and, and four for, for foreign foreign countries. So that, that balance. But but it's you know the, the Hamban Tota thing is is uh, sure it doesn't help Sri Lanka, but it doesn't help China either. It, you know, I mean, if if that goes wrong, you're sure you've got a ninety nine year lease, but you put an awful lot of money in and you're not getting paid back. So so um, you know the risks are shared. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the pro projects right in the first place, which one hopes with experience will happen. Okay, I'll, um, I think there were some questions at the at the at the at the ends there. Yes, 
uh, yes there. Hi, uh, I'm from Myanmar. My name is Tai. I'm doing an MSc political computer just so I I just want to ask the question because you mentioned that the project is helping the developing country. But like I want to again ask someone already mentioned at the front, like how much um, you are developing for the country people because for example in Myanmar we have all the company is owned by the military hunter. So if military asking for more money is not meaning to help in the country or the governments. Thank you. Okay, um, Thomas. Uh, I think the, the Chinese government has stopped uh, uh, investing heavily in uh, Myanmar. Uh, instead, uh, Japan had done a better job in a way. Uh, and because uh, China has no plan to change the government there or change the political culture there, they just uh, concern more with the project. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether China will continue or start to... I, I think the question really isn't about so specific about just uh, what happens in Myanmar. The question really is about Chinese government engage with governments and governments in those countries along Belt and Road do not necessarily care about the welfare of their citizens. Mm -hmm. And her question is really about what is the Chinese government doing to make sure that the citizens of the partner countries along BRI benefit from it in contrast to the elite, the governments in those countries? Well, I think what China is doing nowadays are mostly infrastructure investment. And infrastructure investment benefit more of the general public, not just the elite, although the elite may, may make a better use of it. But uh, I, I, I think it's a bit uh, too demanding to ask uh, China to take up the job uh, to look after the people of uh, Myanmar or the other countries involved. I think uh, this, even the UN cannot do that. Okay, let's, let's move on. Um, yes, let's hear a uh, hopefully Chinese face, Chinese uh, perspective there. Um, hi, thank you for the speech. So my question is that um, you talk about China going global earlier. So how, to what extent and um, in what way does the trade war affect the, the BRR? That's my question. Okay, um, who would you? It, it, it does interrupt, you know, uh, you know, our Belt and Road Initiative or development because, uh, you know, uh, uh, there's a trade war and um, America is putting, you know, in a lot of sanctions to uh, recipient countries like, you know, Russia, Iran, where they're in need of help, you know, on better infrastructure, you know, better, you know, uh, 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 you know, employment uh, opportunities. So, uh, well, it depends on, you know, whether uh, the the West is you know still going against this idea. Otherwise, you know, uh, it, it, it's not going to make the world a better living place. All right, and uh, you know, China is slowing down because you know everybody is against it. Why should we go ahead? So we slow down. You know, it's only the countries that are really in need of the cash that China is putting you know, the money into it. Otherwise, you know, um, a lot of the uh, projects has been suspended for the time being, you know, so uh, the trade war does, you know, um, uh, create some, you know, uh, uh, something block for uh, the Barrow Road Initiative. Okay. Charlie, you want to come in? Yeah, just very briefly. Uh, I don't think tariffs and, and, and Trump's attempts to balance trade are, are, are at all uh, helpful to anything. Um, on the other hand, uh, I think you have to say that uh, it, what is important, much more important than, than, than that, is, is uh, a true level playing field in business, and that's not what's happening, and that's what uh, Europe in particular uh, is. Uh, a reason why Europe now is, is, is becoming more sceptical about Belt and Road and, and, and demanding that, um, that, that things are evened up. And secondly, we get onto the question of intellectual property and, and, and um, a, a proper regime there. Those, those two are really important issues. Uh, tariffs and balancing trade, well, that's Mr. Trump. Okay. <clears throat> For locality equalities, is there anything from this side? Okay, I, I think this side will go for the gentleman at the back. Yeah, you. Yeah. 
uh, there's a microphone coming through. Mr. Parton mentioned globalization, Chinese globalization, but I think we probably ought to distinguish between Chinese globalization and Western globalization. I think Western globalization in some ways reached its nemesis in 2008. And the financial crisis, the problems have not really been resolved. In fact, debt has increased. And economies are really quite stagnant in the West. And also there's the whole question of whether the fiat uh, currencies can be sustained under this sort of uh, economic, um, on this series of economic problems. I would also suggest that the West sees itself from a unipolar position where whatever happens, it should defend that position. Now, if we look at Chinese globalization, and I don't really want to judge this because I'm not in a position to do so, but I think that China's looking at a more multipolar position. And the one crucial thing in my mind that China wants to reintroduce is development. Globalization put an end to development as a concept and a study. And what it did instead was to globalize finance and create an international deregulation. Now, I would say China's objective, and this is probably quite selfish on the part of China, is to re-engage the economy in the process of development. In doing so, it will benefit itself. But I could also say that in doing so, it could potentially help the West as well, because the West does not have an engine of growth. Thank you. Charlie? Um, well, yes. I, I mean, uh... I think um, we should be more welcoming of China's uh, in initiatives on, on, on development. But I don't think you should also disparage the West. I mean, if you look at the, the figures for aid, for instance, um, I think UK aid, aid as opposed to loans, uh, was bigger than China's by a factor of four last year, um, 2016. Uh, America's certain, um, so as well. So. Um, you know, that, that's, let's not disparage what the West is trying to do. Yes, we've, we've made a lot of mistakes, um, uh, and we're probably still making them in terms of the way our, our economies are dealing with um, you know, stagnation and, 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 and banking. Um, but I'm not sure either, that actually, in terms of the economy, that China's model is going to work either. It's still a bit early to say that. Okay. So there's, there's, there's stuff from both of us to learn, but I don't think you should just disparage the West straight off like that. Um, go to the far end uh, there, yes. Uh, the gentleman in the white, yes. Thanks. Uh, my name is Yaniv. I'm from Israel. Um, you mentioned Iran as one of your main uh, recipients of uh, investment. Now, as an Israeli businessman, how much does uh, politics play into it? Because I'm a businessman who wants to go to China, yeah? And let's say that, should I be nervous that you might give more favor to Iran instead of me, as, uh, uh, instead of my country? As, as we all know, Israeli and Iranian relations are not the best, to put it nicely. Um, so how much should I take this into a factor if I'm considering doing business in China, especially with the BRI? Okay. Either way, either yeah, well, I, I, uh... In fact, that's why you need China. You know, um, we deal with Iran, we deal with uh, Israel. You know, Israel is a good friend of China. And uh, the two countries are doing business, you know, um, since, you know, the incorporation of uh, Israel and modern China. So I, I, don't, I don't believe, you know, it will hinder, you know, uh, Israeli, you know, businessmen. You know, uh, China import a lot from uh, Israel. And uh, I, I, I am personally, you know, involving in, uh, in a deal in Israel at this current moment, and uh, funding is from China. So I, I, don't, I don't see why, you know, you have to worry. <laughs> you know, uh, China is doing business with, you know, anyone that needs China. Okay. Now, those of you, you have your, who have the hands up earlier that you have not been uh, uh, called to ask a question, don't give up. I'm just going around... <laughs> to make sure that nobody feels being left out. But I'll try to come back to you as much as I can. Yes, here. Thank you. Um, I'm Ambrose, a student from Hong Kong. And I saw the headlines a few days ago about Trump trying to persuade uh, EU or its government to uh, sponsor its technology to deal with the 5G technology. Because like China is also trying to enforce this um, state-owned enterprise Huawei into certain uh, 5G development in certain EU countries, say Hungary and Romania, for example. How would you guys uh, uh, 
address that about how China is putting its uh, innovation and technology into a global sense and so on. Thank you. Okay. China, Thomas. China is open, and the 5G technology should be a joint venture of all countries involved. It should not be a, a money-making machine by a certain company of a certain country. So China is trying to promote the 5G, and, uh, uh, and I think it's open. For some of you, you go to Shenzhen, I think it's open to all countries to, to help work together. So I don't see this uh, an issue. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid Johnny. I I do see an issue. Uh, and both America and Australia have declared that China, will, Huawei, will not be allowed into development of their 5G. Uh, I think that's with very good reason because uh, the control or potential control by a foreign power of someone else's uh, telecommunications is just too vital a national security interest ever to be allowed to, to, to anyone uh, who um, might use it against you or might threaten to use it against you. It's extremely easy to hide stuff in millions and millions of lines of code, uh, as the Intelligence Committee report on the 2000, in 2013 on the original involvement of uh, Huawei in the UK telecom system, starting about 2003 or five, uh, su suggests. It, it, it cannot be ruled out that the stuff is not there. It's got particularly, I think, more sensitive since the recent national security legislation in China now obliges Chinese companies by law to uh, do what the security authorities deem to be in their national security interests. So, you know, whether or not Huawei is, 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 uh, has or is or will um, uh, do things which it shouldn't with other countries, uh, uh, telecommunications, it would be a very foolish country that put its national security in the hands of another one. But that means uh, uh, the, the same uh, principles should be applied to all, not just to China, but also to America and other countries. For example, in the UK, you should kick off uh, all these uh, foreign-dominated uh, kind of uh, software or yeah, systems. Yeah. But, but so, there, there's a big difference there because the UK is an ally of America. It, we've actually got formal alliances. It's the lesson of, and, and uh, we're not an ally of China. The only ally of China that we're, where there's a formal signed agreement is with North Korea. So it's not the same. Uh, so, well, I think uh, alliance, alliance will change. Uh, this year you are ally, allies and next year you may not. So, okay. I don't think there's, there's going to be an agreement on that one. Let's, let's move on. I, I think the, uh, the lady there first. I'll, I'll try to come to your... Yes. We still have about uh, uh, 23 minutes left. Uh, hello, I have two questions. One... Try to stick to one, please. Okay, fine. Um, I was asked the most important one about the um, debt sustainability. So um, you were saying that like, there's high risk of debt de default. So is there any kind of assessment before the investment um, project actually going on? Are you going to assess the certain countries' risk? Uh, like, are they going? Do they have the ability to pay back all the debt they own to China? If the question refers to my, uh, you know, earlier comments, you know, uh, at the beginning, no, because you know, uh, the the recipient country is in need of the cash. But uh, now, yes, uh, you know, there is always you know the assessment now because uh, China is learning. You know, it's only becoming, you know, rich in the last probably 10 years. So uh, we, we have a long time to, uh, to uh, adapt to that. Okay, let's... Yes, sir, in the, mi in the middle, I'll try to come to, to your... Yes, you. Yes. Thank you very much for the interesting discussion. Um, I would like to follow up on the possible outcomes of the BRI, in particular regarding the possible pacifying effects of the uh, uh, project. Uh, in particular, if we think about Afghanistan and Pakistan, India, and Jammu and Kashmir, could it be so that China could be using uh, its weight in trying to pacify the region in order because security is a prerequisite for development and building things. On the other hand, if China is getting involved, could we see a risk there of China being dragged more and more into these conflicts? Thank you. Who would like to get? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, oh, you, you, you go first, Tom. Yes, uh, for Afghanistan, China is trying to have to uh, have a, a peace uh, settlement. Uh, before then, uh, uh, Americans tried to use uh, Afghanistan as the hub of Central Asia, so they proposed uh, a modern civil war without China, without Russia. 
but it had a uh, lot be uh, materialized. So China is trying to do uh, uh, in a way to have to uh, have the peace uh, agreement and working with the Central Asia countries to, to make uh, Afghanistan once again a hub. And also in the China-Pakistan economic corridor, they also invite Afghanistan to join. So this is a uh, disregard all this uh, political uh, speculation. I think uh, the actual result may be a change, uh, a change of uh, the game in uh, Central Asia. Central Asia is no longer a landlocked country, a landlocked area. It could be the hub of uh, uh, the East and West, North and South. So it depends on uh, Afghanistan. It depends how Central Asia uh, working with Afghanistan. And uh, you can see that there's a recent uh, uh, opening up of uh, Uzbekistan, and that would uh, maybe there's a, a major change that uh, in that area. I spent 13 months working in Afghanistan, uh, and I wish the Chinese all the best because we didn't um, do very well there. Uh, and I think it's extremely. Has anybody done well there? Well, I think that's a, a very, a very good point. Um, and and so um, let's hope that China does an awful lot better than we do. I, I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm not optimistic, um, having been there and, and, and seen the the nature of the uh, of, of, of the uh, disunity and um, the way people will. Uh, act on very small incentives, personal incentives in front of them rather than looking at, at the long term. But, but I, China will have to get much more involved if it wishes to invest in the area, uh, in, in, in the security side of it, which is uh, difficult when China doesn't like the concept of interference in, in other people's countries. Uh, and, and in that context, I think what's happening in Xinjiang is, is, is an additional worry because so far the, the Islamic populations of Central Asia have not reacted very badly to the concentration camps in Xinjiang, but that may not last. And, and, and therefore, we, we saw an, an unfortunate attack on the consulate in Calcutta. These sorts of things may, may become more common. So it's, 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 a, it's a factor. Okay. Four questions. Um, I think the, just the lady behind the, in front of the poll. Next time. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Bernie and I'm a research analyst. Um, we've talked a lot about infrastructure in regards to like trade and investment and the building of uh, BRI. But I was wondering more um, with the building comes people and the movement of people and with immigration being such a hot topic in the West at the moment, I was wondering about your thoughts with regards to the movement of people out of China as the BRI develops. Joseph or, or Well, uh, movement of people, uh, a very good question because I, I do travel to Xinjiang, you know, a lot. We, we, the company that I work for uh, is the mine owner in, uh, in Xinjiang. You know, the move from the people, you know, Xinjiang do not like to have too many people from Central Asia to come into Xinjiang. Whereas, you know, for Central Asia, they don't mind the Han Chinese to go. They don't like the Uyghur to go, you know, for some reasons. You know, probably economic reasons, you know, that they believe, you know, only Hans are rich enough, you know, and uh, not the Uyghurs. So uh, that sort of movement, if you can, you know, see, you know, it's not just, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, security, you know, it's, it's also culture and perception. I think actually, I turn it the other way around almost, it's not so much about migration, it's about the degree to which Chinese globalization can um, promote employment in the countries. And, and, and if it does that and uses um, less Chinese labor and more indigenous labor, and trains up those people, then then I think the development becomes much more sustainable. Um, putting in a you know a railway line or a bridge or whatever, some form an air, airport or a port, is not in itself sustainability. It's it's the, the software that goes with it, the training of the people and the the other types of um, long term employment that flow from it, which is important. So um, the fewer Chinese workers and the more training that China can do then the greater the development and the sustainability of it. More questions? I think there was one. Yes, I think I pro kind of promised you that. You, 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 yes, the lady here. And then I'll come, come to you, sir. 
Yes, thank you. Uh, actually, I have a question for Professor Steve. It's also about the debt thing. Uh, what happens if the receiving countries cannot pay back? So firstly, China, I think China is not forcing any of the countries to accept the loans from the very beginning. And the countries choose to accept the loans, uh, accept the funds voluntarily based on their own analysis of the pros and cons. So meaning if at the end of the day, it turns out that they can't pay back, they should be expecting some kind of legitimate and justifiable like penalties from China. And secondly, why is it when it comes to Belt and Road Initiative, there are so many pessimistic uh, projections on the development of the recipient countries, while when the Western countries try to invest in the development of certain kind of countries, people will focus on how this kind of investment, these funds will help the local people to develop. Thank you. Since you asked me, I will respond. I don't think it's entirely fair to say that we actually look at development aids that European and North American countries give as automatically in positive lights. I think we focus a lot on the problems that those development aids are very poorly invested and not doing very well. So it is the sort of things that are being looked at wherever it is actually being invested, whichever countries is doing it. Now, on the first question you asked in terms of is it fair for people who borrow money that they can't afford that they have to pay back? We live in the 21st century. The world's moved on. In the UK and Europe, we simply don't accept that. Now, perhaps in other parts of the world, there is still an acceptance that if you borrow and you can't afford to borrow, it's your fault. But here, we actually legislate to make sure that companies cannot lend money to people who cannot afford to pay them back. That's not fair on them. That's creating problems for them. So I think it would be a good thing globally that if we accept respecting people and helping them to prevent them falling into that trap is a good thing, that we do not apply and restrict that only to British citizens, but we apply it to citizens of any country. It connects back to the lady from Myanmar's question too, because the leaders may well uh, go for this, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the people support these, these, these projects. Uh, and in Malaysia, there's been some question about whether there was corruption involved. So I think that as part of China's globalization, there needs to be an awful lot more emphasis on fighting corruption abroad. Xi Jinping's doing that within his own country. He's not doing it abroad. Uh, I was... Uh, part of the G20 uh, preparations for the, for the Hangzhou meeting. And it was noticeable that all the talk, and we had a dinner with the, 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 the um, vice minister in charge from the CCDI, um, it was all about help for China's Skynet and, 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 and Fox Hunt. It wasn't about preventing Chinese companies bribing abroad. In fact, there's a very considerable history of that. And, um, so I think that there needs to be as part of the Belt and Road or Chinese globalization, a really big effort on China's part to ensure that its own companies and state companies don't bribe abroad. Okay. And then, then maybe the projects... Go for more questions. I think there was a gentleman at the back that had their hands up and locked. Yes. Yes, thank you. Interesting. So far, yes, I'm persistent. So I'm getting my question. Uh, first of all, a comment which was with China manufacturing PV, which was made here over 150 years ago, it finally became affordable at 25 pence a watt when I was buying it at 2 million pounds per megawatt. If you understand the difference, that's 2 pounds a watt. So thank you very much, China, for making it affordable and 30-year guarantee. My question is, in technology today, we're doing nano and pico technology, which is going into humans. Pico technology is 10 to the minus 15. What does that mean? It means we can make a switch with three atoms. Switch on your cells, switch them off again. Switch on the glandular system, switch it off. So you can see that as we're morphing from humans to something like cyborgs, how is that going to affect China's policy and the globalization that we hear so much of? Because every single civilization from Persia upwards was built on technology. Okay, Tom? Well, 
It's too difficult to project the future. Uh, I, I simply do not know. But what the China is trying to do is the first. They're trying to catch up with the developed countries. So they follow the pattern and models of America, Britain. Now China is a stage of a post uh, catch up period. So China trying to uh, test the frontiers. Uh, it's too early uh, for China to talk about this because China is uh, more pragmatic. Well, uh, maybe uh, they are not innovating enough, but I think you can see that Shenzhen is now the, uh, the hardware uh, Silicon Valley in the world. So they are testing all everything, but it's too early to talk about all these kind of uh, technological scenarios. Okay. I, um, that's the corner that's been overlooked. Yes, the gentleman in the white uh, jacket. Um, a comment. Uh, first of all, um, when talking about Officer BRI... Comment, can you keep it very short? Yes, very short. Uh, when you're talking about BRI, we shouldn't look at very monotonously about Chinese investment as the Chinese money going out to support other countries or doing investment itself. Um, both uh, Professor Thomas Chan and Joseph Chan, Mr. Joseph Chan mentioned something very different. Um, Professor uh, Thomas Chen is trying to mention that China is not being, being a savior. China is not giving out money. But Joseph, uh, Mr. Joseph Chen is trying to say that uh, the money going to uh, countries like Central Asia is like not actually uh, really get, uh, really, uh, really, uh, I mean, China is not actually wanting to get getting those money back. I kind of agree with um, Professor Steve Xiang that um, the loans given to the countries should not uh, be, I mean, unethical in the sense that they cannot repay the loans. Uh, in fact, China is actually trying to establish uh, kind of institutions like the AIIB. In fact, AIIB is not the kind of Chinese money that is ordered from the Chinese government to invest in uh, different countries. The AIIB is an international organization with principles of uh, sticking to international standards. But on the other hand, Chinese investment from the Chinese government orders is actually coming from the Chinese state-owned enterprise. So in the same sense, that Chinese money is actually uh, doing both ways. First, it's in the in that international ways that it follows all the international norms. But at the same time, Chinese money is also channeling through the Chinese government policies to invest in different countries. So um, I would like to ask all the panelists that what do you see the future of Chinese money? Is it going to be a more international standard investment or would it be more stick to the Chinese uh, government official policies? Thank you. Right. Will, Chi will Chinese state investments overseas follow the standards of AIIB, or will it be invested with Chinese characteristics? Can I, can I give uh, some uh, quick response? In the past, China has not so much concern about the A. There's no law established pattern of uh, giving A. Uh, recently, China learned from the Japan. Japan started uh, for all these uh, countries uh, with a uh, 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 soft loan or even A uh, for infrastructure investment. And after that, with the foreign infrastructure, uh, the companies will come. So China uh, just uh, set up an uh, international aid organization uh, last year, or uh, uh, this year. So China is learning from the rest of the world, uh, good practice that may help uh, to channel much better uh, Chinese money into the other countries. Well, I'm not too sure whether AIIB has done anything just yet. You know, it, it's been, you know, talked about and uh, the increasing of members of AIIB, you know, is, you know, ever going. But uh, have you ever heard of a, a project really done by AIIB? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in Asia. Uh, what's interestingly is that the main recipient of AIIB funding is India, which is not very good. It's China, which is... But they still need money. Um, I mean, in India, but they still need money. <laughs> India still need money. Yeah. I so, think the question, the, the, the question really is, is China going to be using its own money in terms of the BRI investment following the standards that AIIB has established? And AIIB has been making major loans to recipient countries following the same kind of standards that other international development banks well, are AIB following. AIIB is not uh, China-owned. So it, it has a board of directors. It doesn't really matter whether China is China or not. I think the question is, will Chinese investments be following the standard that is... If it's Chinese money alone, it's not from AIIB, I'm not too sure. But if it's AIIB, I'm sure it's, you know, pretty much the uh, international standard, you know. What is the international standard is the West standard, okay? And uh, for the Chinese money, you know, to be honest, if you look at the balance sheet of China, a lot of the money are borrowed. All right, Japan is one major lender. 
do you believe Japan will allow China to misuse the money and China is not repaying them back? Look at it, you know, and uh, you, will, you will find the answers. Okay. Um, just, just, very quick intervention here. Just very briefly, AIB has actually lent out so far in the first two years $4.4 billion. Uh, dollars so it, it, it is working um, I think it's I think it's a very good uh, model um, and whether or not China chooses to, to to adopt some of those practices in in in, in Exim Bank or China Development Bank is is, is up to China um, but I do think that we tend to think that China's got any amount of money and it can just spray it around I think it's going to have to be quite careful actually, in, in, in making sure that the way it lends money is effective and sustainable and repayable, preferably. So, so I think it will adopt some of the practices of okay. AIB. At the far end there, yes, that's Professor Simpson. Yes, yes. Hi, my name is Edward Simpson. I'm the director of the SOAS uh, South Asia Institute. I'd like to thank you all for a very interesting discussion, um, which I found quite magical, actually. At the beginning, we were told that the subject of the discussion didn't exist, uh, and then we had 90 minutes of kind of insightful and entertaining discussion about it. Um, the, the second part of the magic is quite often in this lecture theatre, um, people are selling books or films or dance performances of various kinds, and it's quite obvious what the product is that the person is trying to sell. So given that you, the three panellists, have uh, a room full, uh, the largest room on our campus full of impressionable young minds, could I ask you to give us uh, the thought you would like to sell us most, the thought you would like to, uh, us to leave this room with? Thank you, Ed. Um, I'll start with Joseph and then in this order. Sure. Joseph, what is the one thing you want to sell to this room full of impressionable, young, bright mind? Look at Belt and Road Initiative, you know, longer. You know, I mean, it's only five years old, all right? And uh, <laughs> Xi Jinping said, you know, it, it, it should take no less than 50 years to develop it. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure whether I could leave it, you know, to that stage, but at least, you know, I'm, I'm still very uh, confident, you know, about the progress of it. Okay. Uh, the, the focus is a uh, Silk Road spirit, which is not uh, shaped by China, but shaped by all the countries, all the people involved. And, and, and the focus uh, should be on uh, the alliance or civilization, not the classes of civilization or one civilization dominating the world. Charlie? I, I somewhere in my distant mind, I, I remember a phrase, seek truth from facts, can't remember where it came from. Um, my message to everyone will be, l look very carefully at what the Belt of the Road is and try to understand what really l lies behind all the rhetoric. The reality is very important to all of us. And uh, you. I, I wish that I had given you the last question and I still have, I think, about three minutes, so I'll squeeze in one more question. I think the gentleman at the far end, is it? Yeah, thank you so much for the uh, opportunity. Um, what kind of a role do you think Hong Kong or the Greater Bay Area will play in the BRI uh, with the change in the distribution of power we are seeing now with uh, all these provincial governments competing, each, competing with each other uh, in order to garner more power and say uh, in the initiative? And having said that, do you think China can sustain uh, in projecting its influence elsewhere with the current regime mode. Right. I'm, I'm, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm actually glad that we end with this question because after we have two panelists from Hong Kong, so they are as well placed as anybody could be in answering the question of... Well, uh, I, where, where I, I'm, Hong I'm from Hong Kong too, so uh, let me tell you something about, you know, the contribution of Hong Kong. Uh, <laughs> I take a very good example of you know the recent typhoon you know that happened in Hong Kong. We recovered very quickly, all right, and uh, what, in a day. Whereas you know our neighboring you know uh, countries like you know uh, Japan, uh, even America, you know it takes them probably 
months, you know, I mean, uh, they're, they're still recovering it. So I think we can input our, you know, uh, soft power, our software. You know, our civil service did a very good job, you know, despite, you know, the criticism, you know, uh, from uh, the, civil the public. Service, Hong Kong civil service. The Hong Kong civil Hong service, Chinese. you know. Uh, well, uh, you know, Hong Kong is part of China. So uh, Hong Kong is China. So uh, we did a very good job, actually, the last 20 years, you know, since the, uh, the return, you know, to, uh, you know, uh, the motherland. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, that's something we, we can, uh, you know, export to um, the Belt and Road countries. Uh, and also, you know, set an example for the Greater Bay Area competitors. Thomas, quick response of how was uh, Hong Kong fit into, or the, the Hong Kong Delta region fit into the Belt and Road? It depends on uh, how Hong Kong integrate with Shenzhen and Guangzhou, the core cities in the, in the region. I'm not sure. It depends on the initiative of the people and the government. But one thing is certain is that uh, there's a uh, in emergence a uh, uh, huge uh, trade flow along the coastal of China uh, to Southeast Asia, joining up with uh, the China Europe uh, freight train and the China Central Asia freight train. Then now there's a uh, 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 Japan Korea uh, shipping uh, the goods to China, uh, the coastal region, and it could come along the the coastal region uh, through, Hong, uh, through the Pei River Delta region uh, to Guangxi, to Yunnan, and down to uh, Southeast Asia with all this collectivity being uh, improved. So I think this is a, a great uh, uh, opportunity for the Pei River Delta region and Hong Kong. But it depends which will benefit more, depends very much on the initiative of the people and also the government. Okay, Charlie. Second question. You very cleverly snuck, snuck a second question in there, so I'll answer that one, which on whether whether the whole Belt and Road or Chinese globalisation is sustainable. Um, the, the answer is it hasn't done too badly to so far, uh, and but whether or not it's sustainable over the long term really depends on whether. Uh, China succeeds domestically. Um, back in 2007, Wen Jiabao said that the economics and social model was unbalanced, unsustainable, uncoordinated, actually unsustainable at the end. Uh, Xi Jinping repeated that in 2013 in his communique about his explanation about the reforms in 2013. Yang Jiechi repeated it in two, 2017. You know, the model doesn't work. That's what the reform process is about, both the third and the fourth plenum. If China succeeds, uh, and becomes very strong domestically, then of course it, it, it will uh, be strong and, uh, and, 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 and influential externally through, through its globalization. If it doesn't succeed internally, then it won't. Well, thank you very much. And on that point, I will draw these panel discussions to a close. And I would like to thank Joseph Chen, Thomas Chen, Charlie Parton, to all of you who have raised questions and also to those of you who have their hands up but have not been called for your patience in my failures to give you the chance to ask your questions or make your comment. Well, thank you very much. Good evening to you. <laughs>